Okay, this is lecture 38 in the 41 lecture series on creating an international sustainable civilization. So this particular lecture is about Socrates or the way the Greeks pronounce it, Socrates, as a prophet. So I was raised in um, a Methodist church. My father was a Methodist minister. Meth Methodism unites reason and faith. Um, it never occurred to me to split science or humanities, social science away from religion, theology. Um, ever since I was young, I thought of God as energy, not as a person. So I was like a born monist. Um, I also thought um, in high school, so my father told me he was my minister and, he, and my father both, and he told me at age eight, you will have to work out your own theology someday. So I'm still working out my own idea of the good my own philosophy, my own worldview. But the first step of that in high school, I thought to myself, I read a book by Aldous Huxley called The Perennial Philosophy. So, so it's not by accident that somehow I end up reading books that always end up saying, well, it's the perennial philosophy, or it's the primordial philosophy. And I haven't even taught about Aldous Huxley's book yet. I probably never will, although it wouldn't be a bad idea to reread it. But I remember, he didn't mention this at the time, but I had friends who were environmentalists and biology teachers. And so I put those together in high school and I said, whatever else you might think of God or good or anything, there's no way any God would want us to destroy the creation. And that has been sort of my foundational insight. I suppose it was a combination of energy, a fundamental energy, and a fundamental order in the universe, but a very dynamic order. It's just, it's not chaos. Not anything can happen tomorrow. We can understand pattern. Um, and the number one pattern we can understand is that we should use whatever science we have to live sustainably and to change the paradigm of culture and the way we live. Even back in the 60s, the late 60s, all of my parents' friends were into environmentalism, ecology. They talked about zero population growth because population is a major factor, maybe the most important factor in uh, uh, reducing the carbon footprint in living ecologically. The emphasis then wasn't the carbon footprint. It was just cons conservation. It was about um, erosion, species loss. The thing that was interesting then is that it was something tangible that they talked about, something that you could actually tell the public that they would understand, like erosion or, um, uh, but now what happened was the fossil fuel companies got a hold of this. They did not want the public to care about going green. They even wanted the public to resist it. So they reduced all environmental issues into climate change because that is the least precise. It's just a pattern. You, you don't have this instant cause effect, something visible right up front, right? You can't show a picture of mudslides or a picture of whatever. I, it was just much more visible, understandable, and they changed it to something that's holistic. And because of that, it's imprecise. So climate change is about synergistic effects. So once you put carbon in the atmosphere, it stays there. 
And so putting 50 million tons of carbon in the atmosphere this year has a way more deleterious effect than if we put 50 million tons in the air 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, because it's cumulating and cumulating effect. And that that's really the killer. But anyway, so way back, I thought that. And um, I went to college. So I also, my father questioned authority. And so I knew there were people in the name of God who were not uh, supporting the ecumenical movement, religious pluralism. I knew there were people in the name of God that were not supporting the civil rights movement. I knew there were people in the name of God that were supporting the Vietnam War. And I knew there were people in the name of God that were not supporting environmentalism. But all of my friends and my parents' friends and the people at our church or the ones that I knew were supporting these things. And if you, it, some of them voted Republican, some voted Democrat, but it was all about conservation. So the Republicans had no trouble. They were conservationists. Um, they were biology teachers at the college. Two of them were. Um, so it's really changed since then. Um, my main point, though, is that I took that worldview with me and I went to college. And I ran into a liberal school, which is a deconstruction school. And it didn't, it was purely secular. It didn't refer back to old wisdom. It wasn't applying wisdom to current affairs. And I left that school. Didn't know why, really. It wasn't until decades later that it came out that the school is really deconstruction. And so then I went to a Methodist school and I had a teacher whose father was also a Methodist minister. And his father was an activist in anti-racism because he was Japanese American. And in his youth was when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. And so in the US, there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment. And that came up again during COVID when it was thought that there was a lab in China where the virus started. There's still, you know, still isn't known uh, Mr. Fauci says if it's a, was it from an animal or from a lab? But the main point is that it gave this huge rise to anti-Chinese, but then anti-Asian, like Asian Americans are also demonized. So his father became an activist and worked with the uh, mayor and the governor to create the state of Colorado as being an Asian friendly, a safe space. But he developed this view that if you're a religious leader, you question political authorities for the sake of a higher good. You question religious authorities for the sake of a higher good. There is a natural universal standard for justice, and it includes uh, rejecting racism. He also rejected sexism. He rejected greed. He rejected wars motivated by the desire for power and money. And so in the name of, you know, Methodism, being a good Methodist. But then he fell in love with, fell in love with Plato. And so he triggered my love of Plato because Socrates did the same thing. And the emphasis is on Socrates' relationship to his democracy. And so at that time, Nixon was elected and there was a lot of stuff. So our democracy was declining and it was and Nixon got elected on law and order, bringing him, you know, making America great again, going back to traditional values. <laughs> so this is, you know, the conservative party, the Republicans have appealed to these things. It's just that Nixon also started the Environmental Protection Agency. He wanted universal health care. He wanted preschool, high quality preschool. He was much more 
he was farther to the left in terms of social programs, government sponsored than even the Democrats are now. Uh, but the rhetoric, the main emphasis was the Vietnam War, the return to law and order, family values, uh, patriotism, traditional religion. So when I read Plato and Socrates was out there questioning the uh, leaders, the political leaders, he's asking them what is justice. Anyway, I remember reading Plato's dialogues. I had never read anything that I identified with as much as Plato. I just thought I had sort of worked out all these ideas on my own. <laughs> and then I read Plato and it's like, he stole all my highly cherished ideas. <laughs> I thought I thought of that. Um, so that's why, of course, I, I have this idea of the perennial serious questions, the perennial problems, the perennial values. Um, so that that's kind of my background, why, you know, I get excited when I talk about Plato. I also have this YouTube channel that's exclusively dedicated to um, to Greek, uh, the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization. And it has uh, 10 playlists. Uh, one of them is Plato. Uh, there's lots of other ones, a lot of them on Aristotle, Aristotle in the United Nations. One of them is about Indonesia. Uh, so, so I, I did go and get a PhD. I wrote my dissertation on Plato's view of the immortality of the soul. So I've always linked uh, spirituality with philosophy or what's called religion now with philosophy, but that wasn't separated. A philosophical question was what, you know, whether the soul's immortal or not, or what is the soul? The thing is in the modern world, psychology has been reduced, right? To the, when the psyche was reduced to a blank slate, psychology was became a social science as opposed to religion. So this huge gap between the study of the soul and the study and religion, which is really crazy. And that was my dissertation, right? That was my orientation going out into the world as a professional, but I don't know anybody who actually puts those together. The people who specialize in Plato's dialogue on the immortality just are falling into line with however philosophy is being uh, read or the, the tools, the methodic methodologies, which is analytic philosophy. Yeah literalism or Heidegger, you know, it isn't Plato and it completely dissociates itself with any traditions that are called religions, which is, I don't know, when I think about it, it's so far from what Plato had in mind or what, what, what really leads to some insights. It's just not based on the education of the mind because the way even the Fido, even the immortality of the soul is taught, doesn't distinguish between the view of mind and the view of um, knowledge, which is incredible given the nature of the dialogue because only one of the arguments includes mind as a power of the soul. And that's the argument that actually Socrates agrees with, although he doesn't tell you it flat out, it's indirect. But I guess there's nothing I can do about that. I'll just say that you might be interested. Uh, one of those one of those lectures on Plato includes my summary, you know, my synthesis and, and short uh, description of my view of Plato's view of the soul. Um, okay. 
So Socrates is a prophet and his goal is to save Athenian democracy. He fails incidentally. And so I do get discouraged, right? I am amazed at how much the adults I read about or talk to and the students and what their parents have said to them, how anti-democratic it is and how mindless it is. We are not training the mind in the traditional sense of mind. And part of that is because that mind was disembodied and connected to revelation soon after Plato, Neoplatonism, Augustine. And so, um, and it got intellect, uh, anti-intellectual, anti-science. And so we aren't training it. We aren't educating it. We, the enlightenment cut it off. And, so, you know, there's no such thing, or we're going to create a culture without it. Um, <clears throat> didn't work. We end up projecting <clears throat> the whole system of education that exists in the ancient wisdom traditions. Okay. Plato's dialogues are an education of the mind, and he says so. And Socrates says, everything I do is driven by my mind, my noose. That's my way of life. So, Socrates is, was, is, was, uh, shall always be uh, at least one of my heroes. He was a stone cutter. Um, he fought in the war against the Persians, where the Greeks were outnumbered eight to one, and the Persians had an anti-democratic, a very authoritarian society. The king dressed up sort of like a demigod, and he got carried around the city and everybody bows to him. And so the Greeks thought, ah, oh, that's so barbaric. That's horrible. They don't try to cultivate their people. Um, so they invaded and the Greeks won because they took advantage of their geography. And if you're an American, it sounds very much like uh, America was invaded by the British and the and America won, and we won because we took advantage of the geography. So, <laughs> so after the defeat of the Persians, the Greeks, especially the Athenians, experienced a golden age when their culture flourished. Even before the end of the war, however, the two most powerful city states, Athens and Sparta, became afraid of each other. They form power blocks with the other city-states, even when the others preferred to be left alone. So Athens was, um, Athens was structured to be this free and open society that was structured to teach citizens how to think like citizens, okay? Sparta was the war state. Sparta was the city-state structured around training people to fight bravely in war, to become soldiers, generals, and then they could join the council. Some of them would be presidents, but they, the council of elders. Everything was about victory in war as the ultimate value. The Athenians thought they were barbarian. They're a military state because that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is human flourishing, scientific and free scientific inquiry, free speculation about the forces driving the universe, free artistic expression. All the stuff that I keep saying, Aristotle, Aristotle's um, idea of a polis was what Athens was structured to try and develop and sustain. Um, it was structured to constantly communicate to citizens. They were expected to become informed about public affairs and to live their lives in a way that would preserve and develop the city as a whole. They were supposed to link their own flourishing to the city's well-being. The monuments, the religious temples, the rituals, the festivals, the institutions were all designed with this in mind. The city was a democracy by lot. Greek citizens with a certain amount of property, Greek males, 
were eligible to be put on juries and to vote in the assembly, where decisions about war and peace, taxation, and other public affairs were voted on. Okay. The cities built around a huge outcropping with the temple to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, justice, and war at the top. So in that YouTube video, I do have slides and I give my little talk about the rise and fall of Athenian democracy. So I recommend it. It's a kind of popular way. It's got a lot of visuals. Um, I went to Greece 15 summers or 16. It was great. I loved it. Wherever the citizens are, they're reminded that they're supposed to love wisdom and justice, to avoid unnecessary wars, and to conduct wars in a way that leads to peace. This is, you know, the shadow of Athena, you know, falls on you. You need to remember this. On one side of the Acropolis is a theater. Citizens come to watch stories about people or gods or people possessed by the gods who gave in to irrational passions and did great harm to themselves, their families, and their cities. Citizens are supposed to be made aware of their own capacity to feel these emotions and do these things and to know that they will lose their democracy if they give in to these irrational emotions. And again, on the YouTube channel, I have a playlist, three different playlists about uh, three different uh, tragedies, Greek tragedies, one written by each of the tragedians. And I apply Aristotle's virtues and vices and his view of the power of human choice and of the realm of human affairs and of patterns. In, in the poetics, Aristotle's view of poetry is about storytelling in a way that describes patterns, type of people in type of situations, making types of decisions that come to a bad end. They have a reversal from happiness to misery from ignorance to wisdom. Um, and so, so I do apply all of those. And I think people in Indonesia or any sort of tradition could appreciate these patterns and understand that the Greeks were trying to find as many patterns as they could to educate each other so that they wouldn't give in to these irrational desires. So they would be able to take turns ruling and being ruled. So they would rule their city well. So they would think like citizens and they would be able to develop and sustain their democracy. And they would educate their children to love moderation, to avoid these mistakes. And they could pass on the democracy to their children and their children would pass it on to their children. Um, so the theater was very important, as it still is today. Athens, on another side of the Acropolis was the marketplace. A temple to Hephaestus was built overlooking the market. He was the god of the forge and of craftsmanship. His shadow reminded those selling their wares that they should make well-crafted products and sell them at a decent price. They should be just. They should rule for the benefit of the ruled. They should use the skills and talent they have that other people need to help other people flourish. And then they could preserve their democracy. Next to the marketplace of physical goods was the public square, where citizens were expected to go and find out what jury trials are being held and what issues are being voted on in the assembly. So this area also had apartments for citizens who lived in rural areas, but their names had been chosen by lot and they had to come and sit on a jury or vote on the assembly. So they had to have somewhere to stay. That was right there. And then posted was what jury trials are being uh, held at that moment. What's the issue, right? So that 
the people coming could talk about this. And over time, they come every week to the marketplace or they come pretty often. They have a whole history in their head of what's been going on. And they would become better and better at practical wisdom. They would have a history of who they talked to in the marketplace, what they said. Um, they would have a history of, well, how did that decision play out? Was that a good idea? Was that a bad idea? And then there was also the place where the council at the assembly, there was a council of people who determined which issues are being discussed first, second, and third, the ones that introduced the issue. So um, outside of that was a list of what issues are being discussed in the assembly. Again, people are supposed to talk about it, develop a history, what has what have we as a city been confronted with? What decisions did we make? Was that a good idea? Um, okay, so so everybody, right? Rural people would get engaged. It's right there. It's a matter of steps away. Every way possible, the founders and the people who carried on the tradition, the people with power, the wise people did everything they could to say, we need you to be engaged. Um, in the tragic contests, um, okay, there were also three small temples to Athena, the goddess of justice and wisdom, to Zeus, the god of justice, and to Ares, the god of war. Zeus sometimes uh, got too angry. He had sex, he was unfaithful to his wife. He had sex with young women. He took revenge. He was he was nasty guy. And so Athena was always trying to guide him. She was wiser than her father. She didn't want to take over power from him, but she wanted to be able to counsel him because she knew she knew more than he did. She was wiser and she would make better decisions. She had more practical wisdom. And Ares was her half-brother. All he cared about was, was aggression, machismo. And so she checked him, right? Br brutality. War can turn into brutality pretty easily. So she is the wise one, the one who, who checks Ares and makes sure that the wars they're in and the way they fight is just, which means you minimize the amount of harm because you minimize the desire for revenge. You try to take care of the injustice. So this is similar to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. You have to fight back, but you have to do it in a disinterested way. Don't overreact. Don't trigger another, another wave of bad karma. Okay. They reminded, the temples reminded citizens they were supposed to call upon the powers of wisdom, justice, and war in their deliberations about public affairs. Ares was too aggressive. He wanted to show his courage. Are there certain Athenian citizens like that? Will they vote for war when we really don't need war? Will they want us to engage in various campaigns during a war? that are unnecessary? Or do they recommend more brutality in a certain campaign? I mean, you have to be careful and you have to recognize the character of the people in the assembly and what they will argue for or against. Um, are they too extreme? Are they followers of Aries? Are they too possessed by Aries? Um, he wanted to show his courage by fighting even when a war is unnecessary. He was willing to massacre people. So Athena and Zeus both condemned this behavior. Athenian citizens were supposed to keep these stories in mind so that they would not go to war. They wouldn't vote for war unless it was really necessary. And they would make sure to minimize the damage. The apartments, okay, when the citizens were rural areas, okay, I've said that. Uh, and then the council decided on issues. Uh, this is the place where they met, the issues were posted. 
Citizens then went to the open area to gather, discuss the issues of the day. All right, so they are educated. This is public education in citizenship. So today in the US especially, there's all sorts of um, core curriculum, curriculum issues where faculty are deciding how, what should we teach, what classes, what readings, what approaches to promote citizenship. And so that in Indonesia, it should be the same. How do we promote Panchasila? How do we educate Indonesians to be good Indonesian citizens? Socrates was the ideal citizen because during his spare time, he was known for spending time at the agora, the marketplace, talking to whomever was there. He would ask a shoemaker if his first priority was to provide shoes that were good for people's feet, but did not make as much profit, or to provide the kinds of shoes people um could use to show off their wealth or their beauty, even if they were bad for their feet and made a much larger profit, you know? And when the idea of freedom became so corrupt, the shoemaker would say, well, people are free. They make whatever choices they want and I just obey their choices. Of course, I advertise my expensive, worthless shoes because I can make more money. But hey, you know, it's still their choice. They're free. <laughs> okay. He would ask a political leader, what is justice? What do you know? And how do you apply what you know in ways that deserves the level of trust you've been given by the public? Right? It's important. Should we trust these people? Um, do they have goodwill for us? Or are they abusing their power and giving their power to their friends and families? If the experts could not defend themselves, the experts felt humiliated in front of the people gathered and they blamed Socrates for the humiliation. Well, I felt that way about Nixon, right? My political leaders. I would have liked to ask them, what is justice, right? What is virtue? Um, as Socrates' reputation began to grow, more and more people followed him or found him at the Agora and listened while he questioned some interlocutor. A number of the sons of powerful and wealthy Athenians were unsupervised because their fathers were running the city, so they hung out with Socrates. They watched as the powerful men they were taught to trust were shown to be incompetent or corrupt. They began to question all of their authorities. So their parents accused Socrates of corrupting the youth. Of course, it's really their parents and their friends that are corrupting the youth. The most ambitious leaders had their real hid their real motives behind religion, telling people they were doing God's will. Um, the most ambitious leaders, the religious leaders quoted from Homer and Hesiod, or some other culturally honored text to justify their bad behavior. When Socrates questioned or exposed them, they accused Socrates of not believing in the city's gods. So yeah, and Trump is using this religion. He's accusing the liberals of being, you know, atheists, they don't believe in God, they're degenerate. It's the same it, all over the place, I'm not sure exactly how it plays out every year. Socrates was taken to court, charged and killed for his way of life. His message to posterity was, you live in the greatest democracy. Every day you should examine yourself and each other about justice and virtue, making sure you are living carefully examined lives. You should change your minds if necessary and listen to anyone who tells the truth or who even seeks wisdom. Socrates then was a prophet like the others. His focus was on preserving and developing democratic societies. In the Phaedo, Socrates explains why he believes in a divine mind, nous, a force that underlies the universe as we observe it. 
There is an underlying order that drives the universe toward higher and higher levels of complexity within a context of forces that provide limiting condition, conditions. The same force drives the natural world toward higher and higher levels of complexity within a context of order. That would be the biosphere. This made possible the conditions for a creature like us to evolve. Uh, so this is, to me, identical to Aristotle. And even though that not very many people think that, I think the reason has to do with what happened after Aristotle. It was the way that Plato and Aristotle got pitted against each other ever since Neoplatonism. It's not if you just read the text and you read them in Greek and you look at the way Aristotle and Plato use the words energia and dunamis. So everything, every material thing in the universe is a union of a potential, which is the material and actual which is the driving force that forms the material and uh, drives toward reaching its final cause. So for example, a squirrel, right? It, how did the species squirrel come to be? Well, there was genetic mutations until it found a niche. Well, a niche is just a, a, a possibility and actuality of a potential for a certain kind of creature that would be able to survive relative to everything else. So that it's there, it's just we don't know it's there. And so the genes um, divide and pretty soon this one starts to form into an animal, a species, and it fits into the biosphere. So in this process of forming and adapting, um, the material, okay, so there's a genetic mutation is the efficient cause. Then the first efficient material cause, the first one, efficient cause. Then it gradually develops, right? It's formed um, the seed and all the way along in the process from the seed to the mature species, it's the drive toward a species level of species, every, the material is always driven uh, according to how that species forms. And then the reason the mature uh, form exists is because it fits into the biosphere. So there's always some prior uh, actuality. And then the material is driven toward that. So the idea is everything is driven toward higher and higher levels of perfection and the possibility, genetic mutations provide the possibility, but what's already there is a structure and an order and that puts the limiting conditions, but that's why we're able to understand it, the, which is what we do understand. Like we do understand the biosphere, but that was how a creature like us could evolve is that our brains kept responding to the world. And then as we developed more patterns and we got better, we, we developed language to describe it. We developed more complex language, more complex social systems, more complex ways of interacting with the natural world, more knowledge, blah, blah. Eventually we became aware of that, that we had that capacity. And then that's when culture really took off. Uh, but Plato agrees with that basic um, view of reality. Um, so, and, and that's also Aristotle. So Aristotle uses potentiality to actuality. Plato's forms are always referred to as a dunamis. Socrates is actually the energia. He's living out that form. He is, he is what justice is, because as Aristotle says, that justice is this capacity to deliberate well about what to do and then to do it. So the person with practical wisdom, their emotions are trained so that as soon as they go through the 
deliberative process and they decide what's best, they instantly do it. So all the way through the dialogues, Socrates is deliberating with other people. He's also thinking to himself, what should I say next? And in that process, he is what justice is. He is what virtue is. It's not a definition, it's a way of life. And so Plato gives us an image of a way of life. Of course, the image of a way of life isn't a way of life. I can give these lectures about Socrates is the way of life and the life of the mind is, the way, and I can walk away from this lecture and go shoot somebody, right? Like Donald Trump is always saying, but I can describe it. I can get excited about it. I can argue that Plato and Aristotle are so much alike. How did it get so perverted? And yet I can be a really horrible person, <laughs> which drives, you know, I think I know people like that or people who talk about virtue. They love Aristotle, but it doesn't fit with their lifestyle. And it's so confusing. But anyway, I, you know, I've done that. I've made mistakes while I'm, you know, after I've already written all this wonderful stuff, I can still be a bad person. Um, but I do think somebody needs to say that the life of the mind, this is what it's about. And it got corrupted. Understanding these philosophers, got they got misunderstood very soon after they died or after um, so the nature of humanity, the story I tell about the emergence of Greek culture from 800 BCE to Aristotle is the story of the Greeks during the Axial Age. This was when social groups became complex enough for human consciousness to become conscious of itself. All human beings by nature desire to know, Aristotle says. And in his view, in his description of the human psyche, it goes from less complex to more complex. He said, at a certain point, after studying all sorts of patterns, the mind thinks itself. So our capacity to think about our thinking and to see ourselves as the thinkers, the pattern recognizers in a universe that has patterns, that's the mind, that's news. This, um, we have the capacity to understand the forces in the universe and how they all interconnect. The power of soul that grasps the highest good, divine mind, is, is the human mind, the human power. The union of the human mind with our knowledge in all other aspects of nature and culture is wisdom, Sophia. So I would argue, you know, that this union of the moral virtues and the intellectual virtues this coming together into a systems theory, a person who's, you know, advocating systems is, is really, that is Sophia. That is the wisdom of our time. Um, and in the past, the integration of all the moral virtues with the intellectual virtues at a certain point of history, the wisest people, right? The people with Sophia, we're recommending different things because obviously you can't recommend uh, teaching classes on the internet or setting up a YouTube channel. <laughs> There's no such thing. So, you know, it is going to change. Uh, but there's still the basic, what the heck is Sophia? You can still define Sophia. It's this integration of all these capacities. But what the actual practical decisions the way people live that out changes um, over time because the intellectual virtues are different and they have led to different cultural uh, products, different techne. Techne means birth. And it basically means the things that our reasoning powers give birth to, right? Technology. Um, and so over time, the science gets more sophisticated, but it shouldn't refute the other science. And so for science, 
modern science to throw out Aristotle's view was wrong. I mean, it needed to be synthesized and put together, and it wasn't. It was dumped. And so now we have to recover it. I mean, and they rejected any idea of Sophia. Like the whole culture is based on knowledge, not Sophia, because there isn't any overriding good, okay? We got to bring it back. And we have to say, we have to create a global new sphere. So Tyre de Chardin and um, Irvin Laszlo, they were systems thinkers. And they talked about noose, a sphere of noose, where people with a common noose, koinonia, a common view of Sophia, can work together. The model of the wise person. So Aristotle describes the wise person exercises both theoretical and practical wisdom. She understands the highest power in the universe known indirectly by observing how things actually are. They really are ordered this way. So um, she understands the highest power in her soul and activates it to understand all the ways natural species are interconnected to create the most complex biosphere possible, preserving basic ordering forces, like the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, mag and gravity and electromagnetism. She understands the forces in the human psyche, the drives for pleasure and fear, how the virtues arise from them as our societies become more and more complex. She would understand how to link STEM and technology and artificial intelligence with uh, broader wisdom and end up with Sophia, the life of the mind. And I pointed out in earlier lecture that there is a whole group of people now linking, talking about Aristotle and AI. And I, I want to find that group and I want to say, hey guys, <laughs> okay, you know, you know more about AI than I do. And I'd like to be part of your group and I might know a few things. I know that in AI, right away from the get-go, people are thinking about uh, the bad uses. They know this is a tool that could be used for good or evil. This is, you know, we're aware of that now right from the start. There were other things that people thought science would save us. And I think people caught on at this point that Social media didn't save us. The internet didn't save us. Uh, you know, we thought it would at first. We thought the Industrial Revolution, you know, we kept buying into this whole hog. And I think the people who invented AI, two of the people who created it, right, have said a long time ago, hey, this is dangerous. This can really get misused. So the red flag was out there right from the beginning. And so right early on, the people who invented it knew there's a difference between knowledge, technology, and Sophia, wisdom. There has to be an idea of the good. There has to be practical wisdom to guide this. Good, good for them. I mean, it won't necessarily solve the problem, but at least they know that Sophia is important, and there is such a thing as a mind. They wouldn't call it that probably, but that technology has to be guided by ideas of the good. Okay, so she would understand how human beings gather in different types of groups, families, extended families, social groups, organizations to meet people's needs, education, law, government, the arts, business, she understands the many types of situations we face, how we can overreact or underreact, Aristotle's wisdom. In the dialogue, Socrates is Plato's model of a person who's always linking divine mind with his own mind and with the way he treats other people, always doing what's best in the given situation. We're supposed to, when we read Plato, we're supposed to say, this is an education in the mind this is training my mind. I'm supposed to think about why was that question the right question to ask Glaucon at that moment? Why did he respond this way? Why did he follow through with this question? Why, why, why? 
because he has a mind, he has a reason. And Plato's model, this is Plato writing dialogue. This is not history. This is not journalism. This is filtering what Socrates did. He's a type of person in a type of situation, making a type of decision. And he represents the wise man. Okay. Um, we're supposed to see analogies and we're supposed to imitate Socrates' way of life. This is the only way to preserve a democracy. It doesn't mean if you don't have a Socratic gadfly, you won't preserve your democracy because people pick up on it. People can figure this out without ever having read Plato. They don't have to be the sons of stone cutters, right? But it is a certain kind of examined life that's natural to figure out that this is good. And again, I will read all sorts of people will will think twice about a lot of things and they'll write about, gee, you should think twice and all these books and all these new ideas. It's like, okay, they aren't new ideas. That's what, <laughs> that was the revelation I got in college, the very humbling <laughs> revelation was this, all my new ideas are not new. So I guess I'll be a Plato scholar. So, you know, all these other people still think, these are brand new ideas and they're so proud of themselves for creating these ideas. And I just go, no, no, sorry. They're based on the human condition. And would you like, you know, to give up your ego and your, you know, pride and your illusions and sort of, if you admit that this is natural, you've gone through a natural process, then you can all realize, geez, I have a lot to learn from all these wisdom traditions and from systems thinking. And I have a lot to contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number four on education. I mean, you can get really engaged if you humble yourself and realize everything you thought you created is, is kind of old. <laughs> um, okay, the corruption of Athens and the election of a dictator. So the dialogues of Plato show Socrates talking to leaders are revealing that their main goals in life are wealth, pleasure, power, and glory. They take all the freedoms the city provides in order to exploit its institutions and laws for their own benefit. No one cares about the well-being of, this, of the city. They have even forgotten that this was why the founders gave them the opportunity to engage in public life and to structure their lives without government interference. They were supposed to work together. They are the government to create a political community of citizens who create and follow laws made by their elected officials. They were supposed to take pride in being able to govern themselves and not needing any outside authority and not needing force and not looking to a more authoritarian leader and maintaining social harmony, social order um, and avoiding chaos. They, and they, they also never thought they could lose um, their democracy ever. And Plato's pointing out they could and they even lost it in um, 30 years, one generation. So when Plato teaches, when people take Plato's classes, I tell them, you could lose the democracy in 30 years. That's, you know, what I told them 40 years ago when I started teaching. Right now, it's you can lose your democracy in a month. <laughs> Probably when I, I will teach this again, in late August, early September. I'll say you can lose your democracy in two months if you want to. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll say that, but I sure will be thinking that. Eventually, the fact that everyone was exploiting the system led to social instability. Crito, who's one of, so Plato had an uncle who wrote the Constitution of Athens, Solon, and he wrote it to weave the rich and the poor together. And he did have an amnesty to forgive people their debts. 
so they could start over. So that greed and um, debt slavery wouldn't prevent them from creating a democracy. And so he he wrote it, he structured to weave the rich and the poor together. So Solon was sort of the epitome of the state statesman, person with the art of statecraft. And there is a dialogue where Critias and Socrates are talking and Critias is honoring the Oracle at Delphi and Solon. Uh, but in the meantime, he was the one. He's arrogant. In the argument, he's arrogant. He claims to know what he doesn't know. And Socrates calls him out. Socrates exposes him. Uh, but he clearly didn't learn the lesson. So um, Critias is another one of Plato's uncles who was very ambitious and arrogant. He claimed that if he were elected, this was after Athens lost the war and the Spartans allowed them to elect their own president. They demilitarized them, but they thought you can govern yourselves. We don't want to govern you. Uh, we just want to prevent you from being able to go to war, you know? So they, Critias ran, you know, for president. He said, if he's elected, he would fix America's problems. He would make Amer Athens great again. He would return to the traditional values of blind obedience to the rulers and the religious leaders and blind loyalty to the family. This is exactly what the Athenians wanted to break down, making people critical thinkers who hold their family members and leaders accountable for their incompetence and corruption and reading the religious texts critically, not literally. Um, Critias was, I mean, in the tragedies, it's obvious there are characters who are literalists and the ones who quote literally are wrong. They're shown to be wrong or they're characters that have family loyalty. And it shows that they ruined the city because of their loyalty to family or their hangups about their family. Um, it, it shows you, I mean, the whole message is that you need to think critically about family, patriotism, and religion. Uh, by indirectly shows you that, by showing that the people who were that way destroyed the society. <laughs> but still, you know, Critias said that, and the people voted for him, and he conducted a reign of terror. He killed his opponents. He took absolute control. Well, I mean, the same thing is happening in my country. It sort of takes your breath away. Um, that Trump is saying that, and that isn't what America was about. Our founders wanted people to think critically. Just the fact that they liked Confucius Analects was they wanted them to have a broader natural understanding of virtue through which they could criticize the political leaders, the religious leaders, and their own family members. Oh dear, it's such a long story. So Indonesians also, right? To what extent is this the same pattern that Sukarno, the authors of Panchasila, wanted people to think critically. They wanted them to find a natural foundation for those, the traditions in Panchasila one. Panchasila two, if you understand it as Greek humanism, is that natural foundation. You should use it. You shouldn't discriminate against atheists, pagans, anybody, which is what Mr. Marif says, um, because you want to preserve your democracy. So you should call out religious leaders that are intolerant. You should call out political leaders that um, ask, you know, want to make Indonesia great again or um, want blind obedience. They want everyone to be patriotic or pol leaders, political leaders that favor their family. They don't question their family, even when family members clearly are corrupt. This can happen among political leaders, leaders, educational leaders, uh, medical profession leaders, you know, any kind of leaders. If your professionals, fellow professionals are corrupt, you should call them out. If your family members are corrupt, call them out. Otherwise, you're not going to have a democracy. 
recovering the democracy. After nine months, Critias was overthrown. The democracy was restored. However, the citizens wanted to find someone to blame for their collapse. So they accused Socrates. Socrates said that he was already acting in, a, in ways when Critias was in power, he was on a jury and the jury wanted to falsely accuse some generals because that was a political uh, revenge and Socrates wouldn't do it. He walked away from it and he said, I would have gotten killed by Critias and his henchmen, but they got overthrown. So they got overthrown and, and the Democrats recovered but they were, you know, now they were scared and they were trying to get more stable. And so they had to blame somebody. So they accused Socrates. <laughs> Socrates got accused by both sides. Oh, wow. And again, I can identify with this, but that's a long story. Question is whether you can identify with it. Has it actually happened to you or can you anticipate that it could happen to you? Uh, that there are self-identified liberals who think you're too conservative. Just because you're Muslim, doesn't matter if you're a moderate Muslim or a humanist Muslim, there probably are. Are there you know, self-described Muslims who say, you're not really a Muslim? I'm sure that's true. Um, so you're getting accused of religious heresy or whatever. Um, you're getting accused of not being faithful to your country because you want critical thinking, or you're getting accused of your family members think that you're not loyal enough to the family because you're not doing exactly what they want you to do. Who knows, you know, but I can understand. Hopefully, you know, you've all run into that situation. If you don't run into that at certain points in your life, you're not really thinking critically. But you also have to criticize yourself. I mean, it isn't all somebody else who's not thoughtful and self-critical. And I've gone through that too. Um, after watching all this, Plato rejected a political career and he started a school teaching future rulers how to think in patterns. Plato's dialogues show many patterns in how they lost their democracy. Readers today can compare these dialogues to their own countries and figure out how to avoid the mistakes and preserve and develop their free societies. So Plato's students were future leaders in many sectors of society. He says, look guys, you think you can use your privilege to get rich, powerful, popular pleasure. It's not going to work you will lose it. So you better get serious and you better use the authority you have for those over whom you have it or you will have the same fate as Athens. If it doesn't get that bad in your lifetime, the world you pass on to your children, it's that much more likely it'll get that bad in their lifetime. It doesn't take long. Plato's dialogues would be censored in any authoritarian society. So every place I go and teach Plato, the students have the freedom to make choices about their lives. I've given my lecture about Athens with slides in Beijing, Prague, Athens, Olympia, Batesville, Arkansas, a very small conservative town, Indonesia and elsewhere. Everyone listening, understands the problem. Um, oops. Uh, and makes their own analogies. Like they have analogies between who is Critias like, who is Glaucon like. Okay, Plato's dialogues are the best literature I know of to start serious conversations about the most serious issue, how to preserve our free societies now. Now, I'm sure there are uh, plenty of others. Good, good, you know, essays, plays, novels, poems, you know, 
all sorts of intellectual technique products um, that dances, music, dance, you name it. Uh, but this is the best I know. And so this is one of my main pillars of my career has been that. Linking Socrates to the other prophets. Even though the other prophets did not live in democracies like Athens, when I teach the similarities between Socrates and the others, when I show they're all exercising Aristotle's virtues at the time, all the time, students can make analogies and recognize our common humanity. Today, everyone in the world is engaged in the task of creating a global sustainable civilization, except maybe North Korea. <laughs> we should all recognize the prophets who condemn political rhetoric that covers up greed and power hunger. We all need to know when a prophet is exposing our own ignorance and we should dedicate ourselves to loving wisdom and justice for the rest of our lives. This is how we honor Allah, God, or whatever higher powers we honor. Okay, so that's, that's my little take on Plato, but you know, I have 15 videos on my little YouTube if you wanna pursue it further.